Todd, thank you for that introduction. It was so long and so glowing and so exaggerated <laughs> that I feel I almost have to say something about you. How many guys, jobs you got now? <laughs> the interim dean of the graduate school, the acting associate dean here, the head of the Blair Center, the associate director of the Fulbright Institute, that's the only place where I still outrank him. And uh, all that for such a young man. He didn't used to have that beard. He grew it to look a little older, and it kind of helped. In 1994, when he first came to us at the end of that first year, he went to the bookstore to get the regalia, the faculty regalia, to wear to commencement. And they refused to give it to him demanded identification, and even called the department for verification. Todd, you're the only guy I know who gets carded in a bookstore. <laughs> okay, well, embarrassing Todd is my hobby, my day job up in Fayetteville is teaching and writing about Russia. So let's get to that for a bit. An interesting place, a very hard place to figure out. And for a moment, I would like to get into that by asking you to have some sympathy for the Russian artists who paint matryoshkas. Now, you know what those are, don't you? Those nested dolls that you open up one and there's another and so forth and so on. And that used to be a fairly easy task. You, the outside doll was the current leader. And then in succession, the smaller dolls were the leaders who would come before him. But now, of course, an ambiguity. We have President Medvedev and Prime Minister Putin, but yet everybody says Putin is really the power. So I was anxious to buy a new Matryoshka, I collect them, okay, uh, shortly after the presidential election, and for about three months, none were available. And, and knowing what I know about the system, I kind of guessed that probably meant they didn't know how to handle that ambiguity. Well, three months later, they, somebody gave them the story or told them the line, and those matryoshkas began to appear, and they would have the two leaders side by side, both faces. Never back to back, but both faces. And then came the most creative, the one you can own and be politically correct, but at the same time, be safe. Because on a day when it appears that Medvedev is in the lead, you can put this on your desk and be safe. But if the winds seem to shift, <laughs> so you just keep doing this, and of course, if you read the, read the winds correctly, you'll always be safe, you'll always be on the side of, well, if not truth and virtue, at least the winner, okay? And, and that dualism leads us to what I wanna talk about today, very quickly, and then open the floor for questions. As you probably know, we are in the run-up for a presidential race. No, I don't mean ours, I mean theirs. It's coming along in 2012 as well. And 2012 is gonna be an awfully interesting year politically, unless the Mayans were right, I guess, but, but let's set aside that possibility and, and talk about that duality and what it means. And what I want to suggest to you today that there is a fight going on at two levels. And those levels are connected, but they are in some ways independent as well. And whoever wins, uh, whoever or whatever position wins those two fights will structure Russia well for the foreseeable future, certainly until I stop writing books about it. It may even go so long that he won't be around anymore to think about it. Let's talk about the policy side first. There's a fundamental debate going on, sub rosa, as the text of this political battle about the future of Russia, about, if you will, that vision thing. And I'll simplify them for the sake of argument, but they will be understandable issues to an American audience because we've gone through part of this already and decided how we wanted to figure it out. The debate goes basically or between those who sees Russia, 
those who see Russia's future in terms of an industrial, economic, and social profile built around the existing industrial infrastructure. It's not quite an argument to preserve the old smokestack industries, but it is an argument to preserve those things where Russia has its current strength. Oil production, gas production, coal production, steel, aluminum, all of those things that are the most rewarding, the most politically powerful, they're right now the winners. The other side of the argument says, that's fine for now, but we've got to lead Russia through what we in our country call the second industrial revolution into a world of new technology, knowledge-driven industries, think tanks, nanotechnology, and all of this. Well, that argument has people who take their sides, and if you want to take these two guys, Medvedev and Putin, and roughly place them in that argument, not surprising that Putin is on the side of energy and heavy industry and pretty much the way things are now. And Medvedev makes some very clear signs that he's on the other side. Russia's creating a Silicon Valley, a government-created Silicon Valley, and we won't ponder the built-in contradiction of that. But they've set aside a town north of Moscow, Skolkova, it's called, and they've got a pretty good committee of scholars and Nobel laureates designing it, and they've got commitments from some major heavy hitters software producer, uh, producers, that sort of thing, globally, to, to have a footprint there, so maybe they'll get it right. But that debate, of course, is not just about who gets control or who will influence that. It's fundamentally about what Russian politics will look like 10 or 15 years from now. Because if the Skolikova argument takes hold, that will change the industrial profile, that will begin to change the political order, not in terms of institutions, but in terms rather more subtly of who's got the power, who's got the influence. Clearly Medvedev is on the side of, a, of, of that argument, modernization, and about a year ago published a speech that's now widely quoted in which he talks about, well, the title of the speech is Forward period in Russian, and it carries that sense of almost revolutionary charge into the future. And he calls for what he terms a permanent revolution. We can't ever stand still. Now, I'm sure he's got to know that he's quoting from one of the most revolutionary firebrands 75 years ago, Leon Trotsky, who called for the same thing. I presume he also remembers what happened to Leon Trotsky, okay? <laughs> but, but the point is that's the argument, all right? So keep that in mind as we go through now, the nitty gritty of the politics. And let me give you a little bit of the institutional order, okay? Um, I call this section, who's on first, like the old Abbott and Costello sense of it all, you know? One political party, United Russia, dominates the system. It holds 315 of the 450 seats in the lower house of the legislature. It controls the legislatures of most, the vast majority of regions within Russia. Since regional governors are now named by the president, no brainer, they control that one as well, okay. It's a little like in a way Oh, the Liberal Democratic Party in Japan, the way it used to be, or the PRI in Mexico, the way it used to be. And in a perfect world, well, in, these, in the perfect world for these guys, that will continue. We'll have our little squabbles, we'll fight about it, we'll um, get together in a smoke-filled room or a vodka-oiled room or whatever you do it, and we'll talk about who gets to be the nominee this time around for president, and then we'll all rally around the flag. Everybody will win something, and no one will dissent from the decision that keeps us all in power. When asked about it, both Medvedev and Putin say the same thing. How are you going to pick the next presidential candidate? We're going to talk about it, and we'll let you know. We're going to talk about it. Two people. Well, he really means the party, of course. 
And of course, that's a system that's something less than democratic by our values and expectations, but a system that may have sticking power if they can keep it all contained. Look how long the Liberal Democratic Party ruled Japan and how long, even longer, the PRI held power in Mexico. And when they finally fell from power, well, it was a gentle easing out of the system, no major revolutions, whether they moved toward a kind of pluralistic parliamentary system. Now, this is an important, this, this presidential, upcoming presidential election is an important thing because they've changed the Constitution. Uh, it's easy to do. All you have to do is get a majority of the legislature, and remember, they've already got 315 votes, okay? And they've changed the presidential term. It used to, here's what the rule used to be. The rule used to be you can have two, you are limited to two consecutive terms, and those terms are four years. Now catch that word consecutive. We who are suspicious of Russian leadership, which makes up most of the professional community that I deal with, thought that after, okay, Medvedev's gonna win, he got nominated by Putin, and he'll stay in office, for three weeks, three months, whatever, and resign, and then we can call a new presidential election, and Putin then can be elected again because it's not a consecutive third term, okay? Well, the ante's raised even more now because whoever is elected in 2012 serves then a six-year term, and if it's Putin, can have two terms in order. If it's Medvedev, he, he has to count his four-year term, he's ending, and add, add six years on it. And if it's Putin coming back, well, six and six make 12. And that's when the, the hammer, the limit, comes down on him. So this is a big issue. This is about some real issues of politics. Now, what about those other parties? Not serious, not able to mount a serious challenge for the presidency. Of those seats that the uh, United Russia does not hold, 57 are held by the Communist Party. Age will take care of that one, sorry. I mean, I mean but you know, it's, it's a kind of dying last gasp. It, it tries to be an effective vocal opposition, but they haven't got the votes to do very much. 40 of the seats are held by the Liberal Democratic Party, which everybody who talks about it quickly adds, it's not liberal and it's not democratic. And it's not really even a party because it clusters around a fellow named Vladimir Zhirinovsky. Anybody hear, ever hear of this guy? Um, oh, what the heck? I don't care if this is being recorded. He's wacky. <laughs> uh, a political showman, you know, a political showman. I mean, he plays, plays the constituency he wants to develop very well. You know, inside this wackiness, there's a rational mind at work but it's not gonna get him to be a serious candidate for the president. And the other 30 seats are held by a fairly new party called Just Russia, just in, as in justice for Russia, okay? Even add them all together and they're way short of controlling the legislature. And guess what? Each of them hates each of the other parties. So we've got no effective opposition here. So the battle is going to be within United Russia. Who's going to win? Well, they think they can work it out, but let's ponder some possible scenarios, okay? Now remember, both of these guys are young enough to serve two more consecutive terms. Both of them, although they have differing public images, are really quite popular. The legitimate public opinion polls usually run somewhere around the numbers that, that uh, Putin will come in somewhere in the 70s and Medvedev will come in a few points below him in the 70s. 70%, okay? And at one point they got to a point where Medvedev was only one point behind Putin. That got interesting, okay? But they are both viable candidates in this sense. And there are some clear indications that Medvedev is making his play. And, and we can't figure out whether that means he's making a play showing that he's got real backing simply to convince Putin to reappoint him as premier if the two flip-flop, that's the way it was before, all right? Or he wants to mount a serious electoral challenge. Now bring on to the stage a new party, one I haven't mentioned yet. The party is called Forward, Period. 
word that he used to lead off his speech. And although he has said, I will not be a member of, these party, of this party, Putin, for that matter, isn't technically a member of United Russia, distance. I will, however, continues Medvedev, permit it to support me, okay? And we don't know how to read this yet. This is a fairly recent development, all right? If it's just to get le bargaining leverage when the two of them sit down to work it out, as they say they will, that's one kind of political game. And it'll probably result in Putin winning, being nominated for president, and Medvedev getting a better deal than he would not have, would not have gotten had he not formed such a party. You see how the game might go there as, a, as an element of internal party bargaining. Or it could go the other way. Period, forward, might actually go forward. Now, the test will come about, well, the test will come late this year. Regional elections will be held. And if this new party fields candidates and begins actually to win, and this would not be for the national legislature, this would be for the various regional legislatures. If they start to win, even a token number of seats, the game is much more open, much more a free-for-all than any of us had anticipated. So let me give you some scenarios, some possible alternative futures. With the caveat, the human caveat, that I was among those people who said, Barack Obama just can't win the presidency. And, am I, am, and I am also saying now, neither can Sarah Palin. I won't tell you my attitude, my thoughts on whether the two issues are linked or not, but, but, you know, there's always a possibility that what you don't expect could happen. But here are my scenarios. The one they want to see, united Russia remains dominant. Whoever the leading figures are will get together in that smoke-filled room, and they will schmooze, and they will talk, and they will finally come up with a deal. You get to run for president next time, that sort of thing. That's what the LDP did. That's what the PRI did. All of those parties, including United Russia, were divided internally, but they had a good, enough good political sense to bury that division, to contain that division within themselves. And when they worked it out, well, they got to stay in power an awfully long time. And that is, if I were a betting person, that would be my bet. Okay, but that coalition could split up. Take that scenario I just suggested to you. Forward and Medvedev really go out there, out beyond the boundaries of United Russia, and try to show their potential strength. That's going to break it up. That's going to be pretty much like the last phases of LDP rule and PRI rule in Japan and Mexico. And if that continues, well, we may move toward a real multi-party system. And the, and the bet would be you would then look at that and say, the real bet is between this new party and, and United Russia and these other three, Liberal Democrats, Just Russia, Communist Party, they're still going to be on the periphery, most likely. Um, two final scenarios. I call this one the stolen election scenario. Okay? Now, if you follow current affairs, you know that a few years ago, well, more than a few years ago, Ukraine held some awfully bogus elections, producing genuine public opposition. It all came to be color-coded, color you know, the Orange Revolution. And for a while, it was successful. It swept the existing order away. They've, they've come back into power, all right. Same thing happened in Georgia, it was called the Rose Revolution. You always get a flower or a color associated with this. And even in Kyrgyzstan, the same thing occurred. That could happen. Uh, if you talk to Russians today, they are fully cognizant of the level of corruption within their society. Fully cognizant that in most cases, and this is usually controlled at the, the stage of nominations rather than the actual public vote. If you can control the nominations, you don't have to fake the public vote, all right? 
But something's a little hinky there, and uh, guess what? Russia's not letting outside observers in anymore. Now, there's stealing an election, which we can live with, they can live with. And there's also getting caught with your hand in the cookie jar. You get the sense of the difference of what I'm trying to convey? It is so blatant, it is so visible to everyone that it produces this, yeah, let's go down to Red Square and demonstrate, all right? And from that comes, you know, if they survive the first night, then people join them and other issues get added in and pretty soon there's a widespread resistance movement that, you know, probably might even win the first election, but probably won't have sticking power. Now the scenario I know you want to ask about, is Russia a possible future Tunisia or Egypt? Yeah, but it's also a possible future Libya. And what would key this is not that sense of corruption, not that sense that, well, we've put up with it long enough, we caught you with your hand in the cookie jar, it was that egregious. What will trigger that is reaching into the cookie jar and finding no cookies there at all. Economic crisis. Those energy profits, they create a lot of slack. They, you know, they permit the Russians, the Russian government to act like the Saudis, to throw money selectively at problems and to buy off opposition. Now, if you ask me to bet, and remember, this is just a bet, a guess, who's going to come out on top? It's going to be Putin, like it or not. He's got the resources. He really does control most of united Russia, and even if it splits, he'll get the majority of it. All of these regional governors out there who were appointed, most of them appointed by him while he was president, they're the ones out there who turn out the vote. You know, they do a Chicago. They turn out the vote the way we want it to turn out, all right? And he has the image. I mean, um, conjure up what you know of the image of this man. And to us, it's, it's, it's strange. It, this, this strong fellow, this guy who does judo, this guy who likes to be photographed with his shirt off, okay, he works out. Uh, that plays into something that is very comfortable for Russians. If you say to a Russian, what do you most want in your system? What do you most fear? What we want is poriadic, order. What we fear is bez poriadic, the absence of order. And like it or not, he's the symbol of that central strength, that order. He is, and this term goes all the way back, to czarist years where you would refer to a strong landowner as a krepki hazyayan, a strong lord and master. And now having begun with a joke at Todd's expense, sorry about that, I will end with a song. I won't sing it. But I'm going to read you the, the text, the lyrics I should say, of a song that was popular two years ago and it's gonna come back during the presidential race. The title is Takov Kak Putina. I'll translate it later. If I translate it now, I'll throw away the punchline, all right? It was a cross between bubblegum rock and country and western, a country and western lament, like my girlfriend left me and my dog died and my pickup truck won't start, that kind of lament, all right? <laughs> it's being sung by a, a young girl and I will read it, I will go through the, 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 the stanzas and then the chorus and another stanza and then the chorus, all right? My boyfriend has gotten himself into trouble again. He had a fight, well, the best translation is he's in really deep. <laughs> I'm fed up with him, I dumped him. And now cut to the chorus. I want a boyfriend like Putin. <laughs> now the real chorus. 
Someone like Putin, full of strength. Someone like Putin, who doesn't drink. He doesn't, that's fair. Someone like Putin, who doesn't hurt me. Look at the image that's being given here. Someone like Putin, who won't run away. Now back to the second stanza. Yesterday I saw him on the news, Putin. I saw Putin on the news. Okay, the pages are stuck together. Sorry about that. He said, Putin said, the world was at a crossroads. Someone like him is easy to be with at home and with friends. You can hang out with this guy. All right. And now back to the chorus. I want, I want a boyfriend like Putin. It repeats. I, <coughs> someone like Putin full of strength. Someone like Putin who doesn't drink. Someone like Putin who won't hurt me. Someone like Putin who want, won't run away. When's the last time? I mean, all I could come up with out of American equivalence was I'm wild about Harry and Harry's wild about me. And I don't even know if that song were written for Harry Truman, but it sure got used. Um, so if you're a betting person, you've got an office pool going, bet on Putin, okay? But keep an eye on it, because there just might be some surprises. And that's about all I have the clarity to say. But I do thank you for your attention, and I'll welcome any questions you have. We do have time for some questions. If you raise your hand, we'll get a microphone okay. to you. Yeah, let's, let's use the mic, if you would. My, my wife tells me I'm getting to be hard of hearing. At least, I, I think that's what she said. Uh, uh, sir. Yeah, yes, uh, two quick questions. Uh, during... President Obama's first visit to Moscow, it was uh, widely uh, felt that he threw his lot in with Medvedev. Even given the fact that Medvedev was the, the sitting president, uh, many interpreted it as a snub to, yeah. uh, to Putin. And so was, was there any problems there? And well, I think a lot of that is driven by protocol. I would guess there's a lot of back-channel communication going on with Putin as well. I, I mean, you just cover your bets. And, and the second question is that, given the fact that uh, Putin was uh, the former director of the KGB, and given the fact that he, during his presidency, he was very authoritarian, uh, jailed some of his critics, oh, yeah. Yeah. Uh, is, some there, is, there, is there a, a much concern? Is he really this sinister or, or not? Um, okay. Yes and no. Yes, in the sense that he has shown himself to be willing to use very selective violence and repression. If you're at odds with Putin, get a Geiger counter to chest your, your, your cup of tea before you drink it, okay? And if you're a journalist, you'll get a visit from some very nasty people, and you may or may not survive that visit. So yeah, there is that selective sense of it all. But I want to put the KGB thing into perspective. Yes, Putin's first career, if you will, was KGB. But the wimpy half of the KGB, that's not a contradiction to terms, OK? He served as a, well, we would call it industrial espionage. He wasn't out there trying to steal missile secrets or stuff like that. He basically was engaged. The KGB did a lot of this industrial espionage, but that's a cut below. And, and you know, they make no bones about the fact that our best people, you know, they, they do the James Bond stuff and all of that. You know, our secondary people, yeah, they'll go off to, you know, do commercial espionage. And, and even worse, if you're Putin, then, then the top rate people who do com commercial espionage, well, they go off to England and America, you know, where there's really stuff to, stuff to steal. Uh, Putin was posted to Dresden, Germany, okay? Uh, are there really secrets in making China that we could steal in Dresden? So really a second tier player there. His years as director, he was director more because the party wanted to be sure it established, <coughs> no, the system, I'm sorry. The system wanted to be sure that it established control over the FSB, which is the successor to KGB. 
and everybody knew that Putin was a part of this uh, Yeltsin establishment, and if you put Putin in as head, head of KGB, that's, well, that's there to keep the KGB in line, all right? I mean, look, look at the fact that the current defense minister in Russia, his military service has been the two-year obligatory period of service. His job before that, before that, was to run the Russian equivalent of the Internal Revenue Service. And before that, he was involved in the manufacture of furniture. He's a bean counter. But that's exactly what they want. Because the military is corrupt, it's disorganized, and if we're going to put a, a lot of money into new technology for the military, which they're talking about, we want to know where it goes, and we want the beans to be counted accurately. So sometimes the background tells less than it might otherwise seem to tell. And I think this is one of those cases. Are there? Thank you. It's been a very good talk. And you. I think you've uh, thrown your lot in with Putin, which I wouldn't disagree with. <clears throat> Questions about uh, two things. The old term, uh, the Russian bear. Yeah. We all know this term here. I'm really not sure if it's used in the Soviet Union or Russia, but I wonder if Medvedev uh, gets a play on that by his well, name. Medved is the Medved Russian bear. word for bear, and of course that's just how you make a name out of it, indeed. Um, Does he play that? No, up? I don't. I don't think his parents or his grandparents, you know, quite knew that was coming. But there is something significant. Um, Democrats have donkeys, Republicans have elephants, and the symbol of United Russia is the bear. That's their logo. Hmm. Well, yeah, in a sense, he does. I think so. I can have uh, two quick questions, too. Um, I know uh, crisis was kind of uh, averted um, whenever they re-leased uh, out the Black Sea ports yeah. Uh, yeah. to Russia. But I wanted to know if you saw any uh, future conflicts, significant conflicts between Russia and, form and uh, former Soviet republics. And also, um, what do you see Medvedev and Putin doing uh, to, other than throwing them in jail, uh, to kind of uh, take away some of the power from the Russian oligarchs? Take power from whom? The oligarchs. Ah, okay, gotcha. Okay, uh, Russia and the other, what used to be parts of Russia, Ukraine, Central Asia, all that jazz. Um, okay, we could be here all night because there are 14 of those other areas if we took them one by one. Let's take the biggie, Ukraine because that's the one that addresses the, the Stavropol base and all of that kind of stuff. Um, Russia right now is very happy with Ukraine because that Orange Revolution, that got thrown out, legitimately thrown out last time, okay? The president, Ukrainian leadership, A, is not giving evidence of a model that might be applied in Russia why Russia really feared that and feared what happened particularly in Georgia and less so in Kyrgyzstan, wasn't in a military sense. There was a template. There was an example. And, you know, they're paranoid about this whole business that if one country pulls off a revolution, it'll get copied. It's like the Middle East uh, right now, okay, in that sense. So in that sense, Russian-Ukrainian relations are more driven by the internal politics of both nations rather than by this international event that's you know got a lot of legs in history and is very symbolic and all of that. But that's, that's not the driving factor right now. Um, there are some former republics that the Soviet, U Soviet Union, oy, Russia, has got some real problems with them. Georgia. They fought a war, largely because the Georgians messed up and tried to invade they initiated military force against Russia. Bad idea, really bad idea, okay? But that one's not gonna go away for a while. <clears throat> Toward the Baltic states, Lithuania, Estonia, good riddance, okay? Because now we can sell them oil at world prices rather than the old East Bloc prices that used to lead us to subs subsidizing their economies. Relations toward the Central Asian states don't, that don't care much unless the Central Asian states 
sign military basing deals with somebody us and else, and that else is usually us, okay? Um, you used to hear a lot of rhetoric in Russia about Russia's need to protect, save the Russians living abroad. There are like 25 million Russians who live outside of what is now the Russian Federation, but within the boundaries of what used to be the old Soviet Union. Eased off on that. Now that could come back again in a presidential race. Somebody wants to throw a wild card, you, you know, they're picking on our people, we need to do something about it. So that one could come back, but right now it's pretty low on the radar. Can't think of anything else, to be honest with you, that's really on the agenda there. What was the, I'm sorry, you had a second question, I've forgotten. Oh, the oligarchs, yeah. Okay. Um, Russia is now heavily politically influenced by really powerful oligarchs, the second generation. You know, it's sort of like the Star Trek series. You've got the original and then you've got the second generation, all right? That second generation has learned one important lesson. You know, guys like Oleg Derkaska and other guys like that, okay? They can be as rich as they want, but they gotta stay out of politics. Now, if they don't stay out of politics, you know where this is going, don't you? You'll end up in self-imposed exile in London, or you'll end up uh, in a uh, prison or in a cell in Siberia, Hodorkovsky, you know. And they've pretty much gotten, that, that seems to me to be a pretty well understood deal right now. No mention has been made at this point of the military. In yep. all of these scenarios, Absolutely. how important is the military in okay, the military, in the sense of civilian military relationships, has always, Soviet period, post-Soviet period, been kept under strict civilian control. I mean, back in the Soviet era, every unit would have a, a zombolite, a political officer who really was there to keep an eye on the uniformed officers. First seen in the hunt for Red October, if you remember the movie, okay? Um, those kind of officers are no longer directly embedded, but the sense of civilian control and surveillance is still strongly there. Again, go back to the identity of the defense minister. A bean counter. Oh, and the military hates it. I mean, there's this underground, but now he's done a deal. He's clearly said to the, to the uniformed military, I will do my thing, I'll get the book straight, I'll get us honest, which is enough of a threat, but I will let you run the actual strategic dimensions. I won't be second guessing you in terms of weapon systems or tactics, unless of course you run the budget out of line. Then I'll come after you, after you okay? And even with that, there are, you know, there are these occasional things. At one point, the military had made a kind of video about him that was very critical. Well, the video disappeared, and so too did the, well, uh, the people who made it didn't, didn't disappear in the old Stalinist sense, but, you know, they found themselves in civilian life real quick. Um, there are very few Russian military who would um, embed a Rolling Stone reporter, okay, because... I mean, again, it's one of those tacit deals. You, you stick to your job, you keep your line, you don't challenge my sphere of authority, and you'll come out okay. We'll take care of you. I, do you want to pursue another dimension of that? They are moving, uh, as are the Chinese, for example, to technologically modernize their forces. That's gonna cost a lot of money, okay? And that's one of the arguments they use, by the way. Look how this fits together. We have to stay with a basically a raw material producing economic base because that raw material producing economic base gives us current profits to modernize things like the military. Whereas if we engage this other strategy, yeah, in the long run, we may economically be better off and even militarily better off, but that cuts back our revenues and doesn't let us do anything now. 
It's a pretty sophisticated debate, to be honest with you. Jane, right here. One second. Here comes the mic. It's coming behind you. Could you just comment on how you think the life of the people in Russia is any different than the people in the communist Soviet Union? Are the, I mean, I still okay, see them okay. wanting just is to the be absence taken of a, care of. Is the absence of, a, uh, of communism changed the people? Is that kind of what you're asking? Okay. Um, not the absence of communism so much as the introduction of a market economy, which are, of course, linked, but they're not the same thing. Um, forgive me, I've, I've been going to or living in or studying in the, the Soviet Union or Russia for many, many years now, since 19, the way back, okay? Nothing's changed, really. I mean, in terms of the people, okay? And, and, you know, but now, what can you aspire to? Well, you can aspire to a uh, classic example of the old and the new exist, still existing. Fly to St. Petersburg. If, you, if you're coming up this big, wide boulevard, really, four lanes, divider, you know, grassy area in between. You're in the city, and you go by the Stalin-built administrative center for the city. He wanted to move the government out of the old Peter the Great center of the city, move it out there, and he did what Joe Stalin always did. He built an incredibly ugly set of buildings, okay? And in front of that is a statue of Lenin, of course. I mean a monster. It's sitting on this big pedestal. You know, you're not, you're below the feet level, okay? And then it's total maybe 50 feet tall. And like all, or like many of these heroic Lenin statues, it's, it's got this pose, pointing to the future. You know what it points to now? The Jaguar dealership across the street. <laughs> some things change, some things don't. Jan, right there. Either of them is fine. I just have a disagreement with you on the people there today as compared to, say, 40 years ago. I spent time there then, and everybody had a job. Oh, yeah, okay. There were two ladies out on the front of the American embassy whose job was to sweep the sidewalk in the mm -hmm. summer, chip off the ice in the winter. They were paid almost the same as teachers and doctors. Mm -hmm. uh, today, there are beggars on the street. Oh. You didn't see those in the 60s and 70s in the Soviet Union. So my view is that there is a change there. Now, well, yeah, yeah, you did see him if you knew where to look, okay? <laughs> I mean, I'm, I'm not challenging what you're saying, but yes, at, at the level you are talking about, there is a, a visible difference. Now, part of, that, part of that is highly generational. You know, if you ask a Soviet audience somewhere 60 or above, what was the best time? Well, the, Brez the Brezhnev years. Because, you know, there were jobs for everybody and there were always, there was always bread in the stores and that sort of thing. And now, yes, very different. You can fail in that system. And the younger generation embraces it. So real difference in that context. Uh, and I, as I said, highly generational in nature. I don't know, you want me to pursue that further? I mean, I, I just don't know what else to say. Do you still have a question, sir, right next? Uh, how do the Russian people view Mikhail Gorbachev? In, I'm trying to remember the year, roughly about 1989, 90, something like that, um, I was in a Russian theater with a bunch of Russians and, and my wife and all of that. And occasionally, the Soviet era of films would be preceded with something you never see anymore, a newsreel, okay? And this particular newsreel glorified Gorbachev. He'd just done some, you know, 
big thing abroad, he'd gone abroad and, you know, wowed Maggie Thatcher or came here and upstaged uh, George Bush, uh, Herbert Walker Bush or whatever it was. And as we are leaving the theater, we, this group, we are speaking sometimes in Russian, sometimes in English, um, about this. And we walk past, you know, this little old lady, Babushka, somewhere between 80 and 200 years old, <laughs> who looks at us with disgust and says in Russian, she probably doesn't even think we'll understand this, if you like him so much, why don't you take the son of a bitch home with you? <laughs> in the sense that he was the guy that disrupted it all, okay? He ran for the presidency in, in, uh, after the fall of communism, got one half of 1% of the vote. Now, will history look at him differently? Yeah. Okay. Will he become a Russian Harry Truman in terms of the reversing? Reversals? Yeah, maybe. It's possible. But right now, he's just seen as the guy who messed it all up. Started, and, and it's, it's not that he started change. That's not the issue. It is that he lost control of change. Big difference. Right He's raising yeah. hey, uh, I One second. One second. Uh, a guy I thought was my friend suggested if I wanted a new hat, I should go down and buy one that was styled after Gorbachev's hat, mm -hmm. so, which I did. And it was the only one on the street. And for four years, I wore this hat, realizing that more and more and more that he, he wasn't all that popular guy. Mm -hmm. But question back to uh, uh, Mikhail. Kordakovsky, the guy that was in, yes. yeah, that's the guy prison. in jail. Yeah, he okay. was head of UCOS. In, in mm -hmm. October of 2003, it looked like the Western oil companies were getting very close to buying a big part of his company, maybe yeah. if not all of it. And then he's accused of having all this tax evasion with UCOS. Yeah. Yeah. And then there's this question about whether he was really trying to take over and run for presidency. Yeah. Of, of all that, which is the most important? I guess that's uh, my They are all true to some degree. Yeah. Okay. This was a politically ambitious person. This was a person who probably would have accepted a Western buyout. I mean, you know, BP is negotiating in, in yeah. Russia these days. If you want to rank order the sins, so to speak, though, the consummate dangerous sin was that it, at one point, uh, Putin had called in this old generation of oligarchs. I mean, sat them down in the same room and said, the new rules are, this was direct conversation, the new rules basically are that you can enrich yourself as much as you want, but you stay out of politics. And he wouldn't buy the rule. Um, that was, you know, ignoring Putin. I mean, that turned into a one-on-one, -on -one, mano a mano kind of thing. And, and I think that, more than anything else, did him in. We have time for two more, right here and then Dewey. Uh, could you comment on the relationship between Russia and China? Right now, uh, principally commercial, all right? They have gone a long way toward resolving what was the biggest issue between them, and that were territorial disputes over boundaries drawn in the late Tsarist period when, when, when Russia here's the Chinese version, took advantage of us, okay? Uh, they have settled most of that issue. It used to be incredibly dramatic. It's sort of like the, the, the thing with the Kuril Islands and, and Japan, all right? More emotional than really geographic, all right? Having settled that, what drives that relationship now is, is commercial in the sense of um, if you go into Soviet Soviet, I keep doing it. Sorry, if you go into Russian stores, particularly the stuff that sells to uh, the average audience, not the, up, not the upscale stuff, um, you'll see a lot of Chinese-made stuff there, okay? Not quite as much as Walmart, but a lot, all right? <laughs> Walmart now has, by the way, a small office in Moscow, just testing the waters, okay? And the reverse flow, Russia has just finished, maybe as of four months ago, six months ago, 
a pipeline going the other way. Most of the old pipelines went to West Europe. Now they're going the other way. And if you ever stood on a street corner in Beijing and counted the cars, you know why. So that relationship, I mean, sure, there are still issues that could fall out over or something like that. But that's not what's really driving the relationship, I think, now. David? Maybe I'm uh, the student from here at the Clinton School. I'm from Indonesia. My question is actually in addition to the, the gentleman's question, I would like to know how you see the relation between Russia and China affect United States of America in terms of foreign policy. How should we, I'm, I'm, I want to be sure I've understood, how should we play that kind of thing? How do we get into it? Uh, no, how, how do you see the, uh, the friendship between Russia and China affect United States foreign policy? It's not friendship, it's just business. <laughs> no, I mean, that's, I'm, I'm trying, not trying to be facetious, but you know, that line we always use, it's just business, it's not personal. That, I think, is the governing, you know, that's the tone of it now.